Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. And today we got some amazing, amazing stuff. It's February 17th, so McLaren. McLaren. McLaren brand dropped some first, great stuff. First brand new car in a long, long time. In a very long time. Let's, uh, let's take a look here. What's it called? The Artura? Artura. I think it's, a, it's kind of a strange name. It's kind of like... <laughs> Like Arthur, but kind of uh, italicized. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely a weird name, but you you made a good point. It is a completely new car. Um, first one since yeah. the MP four twelve C, the fax machine. Yeah, I mean, and the MP four twelve. That's what twenty twelve. I think when that that first came out and they've just been building on that platform ever since uh obviously they pushed it a lot further and they've built up a lot of market share i think that's one of the things that people don't understand about mclaren you know when they first came out with mp4 they were no one they were they weren't really you know obviously they had their f1 uh and they they always did well in f1 but uh the compared only to ferrari car was yeah the only street yeah. car was a slr teamed up with uh, if, if that if that counts, but yeah, back then it wasn't taken that seriously as a brand. And I think they've, they've kind of flipped the market. They've disrupted the market so significantly over the last few years. And they're, they're viewed just up there with Lamborghini and Ferrari. I think Ferrari, their products over the last few years have really slipped a little bit in my opinion. Uh, they don't look quite as compelling as they used to. And uh, the names are terrible. What do you mean? Don't you want an F8 Tributo? <laughs> or super fast. <laughs> Su- super fast? Uh, super fast is a great name. <laughs> what do you drive these like days? Oh, I drive something that's super fast. Yeah, it's a great they, name. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even look that great anymore. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Mr. Ferrari is, is Mr. Not... Ferrari is very upset right now with uh, the comments that you made. <laughs> yeah, if he ever but... listens to it, <laughs> yeah, the A12 is not a good-looking car, in my opinion. It, yeah, there, there's some nice ones. The Roma is kind of nice for a GD car, but it doesn't have that brand identity. But back yeah, to the... this McLaren. <laughs> I was <laughs> gonna say the Roma doesn't look like a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like a Ferrari. But good, good, good thing to mention because this McLaren, even though it's all brand new. Uh, it looks very, like a McLaren. Very McLaren look. You know, it looks love like love the the headlight. It the headlights yeah. exactly P one shape. The tail lights exactly how all McLarens look. It's an evolution of their product. Even though it's brand new, it looks like something of the past. While right. some people may not like that though. That's the thing. Some people's like, oh, it's a brand new car. It should look brand new. The thing that's always been a challenge for me with McLaren is that they've built and and re reimagined their car every two years and it's kind of hard to keep up and it's like if you buy one now it's it's just a matter of time till it becomes obsolete again so we went mp4 and then was 650 720 675 somewhere in between there 765 yeah. yeah and there's just like a lot of models that just kind of phase out the old one and it's almost like changing iphones but we're talking about half a million dollars well when you got the money it's basically the same as what i would consider an iphone to cost anyways probably yeah <laughs> if you're a billionaire looking to buy a supercar yeah yeah so as mentioned this is a brand new architecture it's the mclaren carbon lightweight architecture um, there's a brand new engine as well no more 3.8 liter twin turbo v8 it is now a twin turbo three liter six with direct injection something that's new for mclaren um <laughs> it's uh it features a dry sump lump lump not lump um, <laughs> dry sump lubrication <laughs> dry sump. <laughs> my my notes here are absolutely horrible um it's 120 degree v rather than the traditional 90 mm. and because of the 120 degree v um you're able to mount the engine lower to have a lower center of gravity which actually is quite smart um it's a hot v as well so there's a the turbos are mounted in kind of between the v itself uh for better well flow for the exhaust gases in terms of power uh 577 horsepower and 431 from the engine itself but this is a phev 
podcast you like to mention, uh, plug-in hybrid, which means with the electric motor, 700 and 671 horsepower, 531 pound-feet of torque, which is significant. Yeah, it's a good, and you know, it's worth mentioning the price point of this car. It's going to start at around 230,000 US, I believe, uh, which is going to be in line with kind of where you start with cars like the Lamborghini uh, Huracan. And I don't think Ferrari really has a mid-engine offering at that price point. No. But that's kind of upper end of the 911. So it's not kind of as unobtainable as it might seem. It's, you know, it's a little bit more than your fully loaded Tesla. um, It weighs about the same as your Porsche 911. That's the best part. Even with the battery the electronics, everything, it's 3,300 pounds. Yeah, and uh, I was reading that, was it uh, the battery is, what, 15 kilos or something like that? Uh, The battery itself, it's 190 yeah, 194 I think it's pounds. something to do with the motors and various The motor stuff, is 34 but... pounds. Um, total yeah. for the EV is 287 pounds. Um, but the electric motor is like a, a lot smaller than yeah, it's before. very flat. There's a picture I think of uh, how how that looks uh, on the Atura. The I think if you scroll down on that page, there's there, there's kind of like a cutaway of where the battery is positioned. Mm. It's really okay. flat, really low profile, uh, super light battery. And, yeah, um, it's right below the gas tank. Um, so it's in the center of the vehicle, um, in terms of kind of where the weight distribution would kind of be, it's low, um, to make sure that all that mass from the battery stays nice and low. It's really, really well thought out. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I really like about McLaren as a brand is they're always able to kind of integrate both the functional aspect and the form aspect, but now also with efficiency, because, you know, this car, because it's brand new, they're able to integrate some new stuff on it. They have ADAS technology, uh, radar cruise control. Now it's all yeah. very seamless there in the front bumper. Um, it's it's kind of nice to see. And, you know, this is the way of the future. Um, it's 90, what, 94 horsepower from that electric motor. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's all about the torque infill. You know, we're, we're killing lag, giving better response. Uh, it's it's a win-win across the board because it's going to give you, uh, it, it gets, what, 30 kilometers of EV range, uh, which is fine. Which is like the, uh, the max of on the WLTP cycle. So chances is you're not going to get that in terms of actual range. But it's not, that's not what it's designed for. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is going to help as far as efficiency overall. And it's just cool what they've done with the packaging. And um, I like the curves and everything about it. Like, they've been, they've been able to make very kind of aerodynamic and slippery cars also look very pretty, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's a... It's a really good study of industrial design and engineering and everything just works together. And this is a um, really good step up for McLaren, I think, to be really a leader in the industry as far as supercars go. Mm-hmm. Something I actually really like about it is the um, the transmission. Um, from the previous was a seven speed. Now it's an eight speed do clutch and there's no reverse gear. So they're actually made able to make it smaller than the seven speed that it replaced. Mm-hmm. Um, and because there's no reverse gear, I mean, oh, there's still a reverse. It just uses the electric motor, which is smart. I mean, genius, you just run yeah. the electric motor in reverse and you get reverse. Um, so the battery will never be like fully depleted. Um, and the engine itself can drive um to a generator that powers yeah to, to generate a little bit of power yeah. so that you still can go reverse so there shouldn't be any worries of <laughs> if you park your car somewhere you just can't back out no that, that shouldn't be the case <laughs> yeah and I, I read something about this dual clutch transmission that they're putting in um basically between shifts they use the electric motor to kind of keep everything moving smoothly and 
it's it's crazy how they've integrated this technology. I don't know how that will work out. We haven't seen any reviews, obviously. This is really new. Uh, I think this came out yes today, yesterday, 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 yesterday. So this is really new news. Um, <laughs> funny yeah. enough, I got a call about an hour ago from a friend of mine that has a 570s, and she she doesn't drive the car it's her dad's car but he's out of the country so she kind of keeps it topped up uh so she charges it with their supply charger and um i guess one of the things with mclaren so far that's been a little bit of an issue is their electronics and their reliability and she's saying you know she was able to start the car but and the charger says the battery's full but the car is saying the battery's critically low uh and she's like am i gonna am i if i take this out for a quick drive is it going to just stall out on me i'm like it should be okay if the engine's running but I know when when the McLaren when the MP412 first came out, that was one of the things that plagued it was had a lot of issues with the infotainment, the keyless entry system, stuff like that. Those seem to have ironed out over the years. But uh, you know, I'm curious with this push for electrification and new technology, um, are we going to have kind of more of that kind of quirkiness with these cars? Well, it's hard to uh, say. I mean. It's still a British vehicle, um, not <laughs> and a very small company. Uh, yeah, <laughs> put into perspective, we're not talking about you know Lamborghini sorted it out because Lamborghini is now really an Audi. It's an and Audi so Electronics, so they're quite stable in that regard, very yeah. above average. But uh, McLaren, so... obviously, <laughs> yeah, yeah, M- McLaren, I guess, took the electronic playbook from like Land Rover. Jaguar or Jaguar, I should say. Um, so yeah, I can definitely see that you know them having some problems. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I've never owned one. Um, I have driven one for a very short time, like it was just a few hours. So I can't say too much about the reliability part. But what I can say it was just a it was an experience that I I miss. I mean the. It was a uh, it was a 650s, so it has the ELSD, um, and of course, a lot of people are like, "Oh, McLaren doesn't have an actual limited slip diff in the back." But driving that 650s with the ELSD, it <laughs> definitely didn't seem like it needed anything mechanical in the back. Yeah, I think performance-wise, they're really at the forefront um, as far as production cars go. Um, and you know, ultimately, if you're getting a car like this, you got to be able to put up with a bit of quirks and reliability hiccups here and there. Uh, I think it comes with the territory. It's it's totally acceptable. It's just speaking of yeah. quirks. Um, what do you think of the Apple Watch mounted in the middle of the dash here? <laughs> yeah, the dial is is a little bit strange. I think the interior the, is not as pretty as outgoing McLarens. Like this shape is not very inspiring. That vent in the middle looks like it was lifted off some subcompact hatchback that shape i think i've seen it on a yaris or a prius c (laughs) so it's not a it's not an attractive shape and the things are kind of all thrown together kind of haphazardly it looks like um so so interior wise not not that stimulating (laughs) i i read that they took a lot of feedback from the current mclaren owners and a lot of mclaren owners were complaining how a lot of the switch gear was not within reach. Um, as you know, a lot of new cars these days, the steering wheel is full of controls. Um, like new Mercedes, Porsche, there's always like a dial to change the uh, different modes. For McLaren, they want to keep it simple. You know, when you're driving the car, there's, well, the steering wheel has no buttons on it other than the horn. There's nothing that's on there. To switch the power modes and whatnot, it's above the cluster or just beside the cluster. So you change, like able to change like the horrible placement in the lexus that's another story uh but (laughs) you're able to do you have to take your hands off the wheel to change the uh the engine as well as the chassis kind of tuning i don't mind that but what i like is the buttons on the bottom they made the parental in this case a prnd a lot easier to reach compared to peer uh the previous mclarens Mm -hmm. so you know when you're driving it when you need to shift in the reverse you're not reaching for a gear it's at hand i think that's something that a lot of people take for granted yeah it's a very simple interior 
Uh, I just think they they could have done better styling wise. It just, yeah. Well, I mean, this is the first, right? This is the first. Look at look at how much blurb that they give here. Jeez. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> the engineering behind it is insane. If you really like want to nerd out, that's a great place to start. Is that press release is so long? I just skimmed through it. Um, I. Honestly, this is like the first of their cars, right? So kind of like how the um, 560S is one of their cars, but there's the 575, 575LT. Like this is their sport series. They're going to develop faster versions of this. It's going to be a better version of this uh, in the near future. So it's just a matter of time before we see something even better from McLaren. But I think this is an amazing start for them, kind of like, you know, in the direction that the company is going. Yeah, I'm curious what their naming scheme is going to be going forward, whether they're going to go with names or they're going to go with numbers and letters. I'm thinking they're going to go with names because, I mean, brand new series and they're calling the Artura. Um, I mean, if they're going to be just like before and just using a number sequence, they would have called this the... I don't know. Well, they can't call it 600. 600 E or something. <laughs> or like, yeah. Because 600 is part of the, the not the the sports series, is part of their GT series. Because the 600 is a 650, 675. You know what? It, they're probably, you can call it 580 E, if anything. Just one above the 575. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of naming vehicles, actually, is there anything else you want to say about the McLaren? Mm, I think we've covered it. I, I mean, yeah. it's 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 an evolution, and it's it's McLaren going the right directions. To sum it up, I think um, we'll we'll see more once reviews comes out on this thing. Uh, I think it's it's going to be a popular vehicle because it's the right price. Like you, you're getting you're getting really good performance for the money. I feel like. Mm -hmm, absolutely um speaking about performance for the money there is something else that came out recently right the premiere for the 911 gt3 the 992 variant um what do we know about this new beetle and what is amazing about it you know porsche people are going to drool over this and and buy it regardless. Any GT car uh, is is just super desirable. You can you can make as many as you want, and it will sell out 100%. And there's a lineup. You have to go through dealer loopholes and trade in your car, sell your car back to them, trade it in again, and all these stories about dealers marking them up or whatnot to get you into a GT car. So GT car is always going to be super desirable. GT3, um, it's kind of their, the first level of GT car for a 911. Um, so it's above the GT4 and the GT4 RS that's coming. Uh, but Obviously, with the GT3, we know there will be a GT3 RS down the road. Uh, what's new about this? It's it's kind of a refinement of the outgoing 991 GT3. Um, it's about 10 horsepower and 10 foot-pound of torque more. It's not a crazy amount of power gain. Uh, it's bigger. It's wider. It's stiffer, obviously. Um, control arms, something about control arms coming off of the uh, cup car. Um, so I guess that means a little bit less uh, isolation, a little bit more raw, uh, more direct feeling. And obviously, I guess the things to point out out of the box is going to be that wing, the swan neck. Supposedly lets air go underneath the spoiler a little bit cleaner. Uh, it looks better on this than it did on the GT4 RS that we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, kind of flying around the Nürburgring. This one looks more natural, looks like a race car. It looks uh, good in addition to that ducktail that's on there. The two mm -hmm. combination, it looks amazing. Yeah, I think it's a better looking... Uh, execution of kind of an over the top wing i mean gt3 always has been a little bit over the top with their wing the thing i don't like is the front end though that grill 
or those vents. Supposedly, you're getting a lot more downforce out of this. I forgot how many percent, but GD3's always had a little front vent. Ever since the 996, we've had front vent, um, you know, on the on the bonnet there. But this is the least elegant <laughs> application of that. Uh, I guess the RS model had right there mm, had the uh front the three fence. little vents on there yeah, yeah yeah the 997 one looks pretty good it's very seamless into the it matches the shape of the uh opening that's on the leading edge there very nice um 99991 it was very nice as well um just again matched up with that curvature on the hood this one is just jagged it's just thrown in there very very awkward and it also makes the badge look like it doesn't belong there, which it kind of doesn't. I mean, if we really want to talk GT car, the GT3 is going to have lighter windows, less uh, sound dampening, and it's going to be it's going to be the lightweight model. And um, before GT3 RS, uh, ever since the 996 generation, uh, they had the sticker emblem just to show how serious they were about how lightweight it was. Lightweight. Uh, engineering and this one's got a badge there which i think it just looks really out of place whether it's a sticker or a badge or whatever the way that vent wraps around it it just doesn't work um, I, i'm with that. you on that I, i'm not a big fan of that front nostril vent it just yeah. doesn't look right on the front end of the gt3 it's not as clean as the previous versions i really really liked um, not the 996 version. The 996 didn't look good to me, uh, but 997 I think was probably the one of the better ones, yeah. and it was inotrusive, right? So it's right on that leading edge. It looks like it's it looks like it belongs. Um, but what I do like about the 992 is the uh, the front bumper. Yeah, I actually really like that front bumper because it's of how way better than what's on the Carrera because the Carrera yeah. looks like it's wearing a mouth guard. This one is way way better the way it's flared out, uh, and the way um, you have the body color accents going down just kind of trims it up nicely. Looks I, muscular and sporty. Yeah, yeah, it, I think it looks good overall. Um, but the interior, of course, had a relatively decent kind of upgrade as well. Um, the shifter. Let's talk about that. No matter if you get an automatic or manual or automatic to your PDK, um, you can get a seven-speed PDK or a six-speed manual. You will get this shift knob, not the razor-looking thing that you get on the regular um, Carreras. But this actually looks kind of cool. But if it's a PDK, it just looks a little odd, maybe, because it's still like a regular shifter. Yeah, at a quick glance, it looks like a manual shifter. The way the shift boot is designed, um, rather than that smooth PDK look, it, it, lo it looks way better than the, the shaver, as you mentioned. Um, one thing with the manual is that this is going to be a six speed rather than a seven speed that's in all the other 911s. Uh, that's for weight savings, actually. So in those cars, the seventh gear is really an overdrive for better uh, fuel economy obviously but you don't need that in a gt3 so one less cog that's less weight and who cares about fuel economy it's a gt car yeah and something that i actually do like here is unlike the regular carreras where even the non-turbos have turbos the gt3 stays true to the gt3 lineup it's a four liter boxer six with itbs there's a 9,000 RPM red line, 502 horsepower. Like said, it's only about 10 more than previous, but it is naturally aspirated with individual throttle bodies. That is, that is quite unique and very cool in this day and age. Yeah, it's one of the last ones, and that's, that does make this car really special. I mean, uh, how many other cars are there? High-performance cars that are na na like yeah lamborghini Huracan, still has the ventador door yeah and that's about it <laughs> um one thing about the interior of this car i think the seats are kind of the same gt racing bucket that we've seen i think it's again is it time for a change because we've seen this seat for what five six years now i um, think it's fine it's nice but it's uh 
it's a little bit long in the tooth for me, but the carbon fiber is nice. It, I sat in one, uh, not the 992, obviously. I sat in a 991. I was comfortable. I enjoyed it. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't have to look fancy. That's the thing with Porsches, right? Like, um, they're not designed to be fancy. They're designed to be unique and different, but still very true to its roots. And the seat, while, yeah, it's not flashy in any way, they're light, they're comfortable, and they're really well bucketed to have you remain in that seat no matter what kind of corner that you're you know, coming around. Yeah, let's take a closer look at the cage. It's quite wild. There was only one shot of the cage. Um, mm -hmm. This cage is part of, I think, the optional club sport package. So. It is. 996, we had a club sport, uh, not in Canada or North America, uh, but that gives you what a fire extinguisher gives you those, gives you six point uh, belts. And this really wild cage has got diagonals and crossbars and a lot of strengthening involved with this cage. I think maybe a little bit over the top, but it's cool. You know, that's kind of what I want out of a GT3 is yeah. this kind of cage. Well, it looks amazing. I mean, you can't look out the back. It's just complete scaffolding. It's great. Well, there is a cutout for your rearview mirror, so it's still good good usable. enough. Yeah. Well. And <laughs> yeah. I think one thing to mention though with the GT3 is it is a big car. Like I think the curves hide it well, but it's grown even more. The 991 was huge, already larger than uh the Dodge Viper at the time. This is even a step further than that. They've kept the weight down, which is good, but I think physically it is a massive car and the RS is going to be even wider. So it's it's kind of crazy, you know, they keep making them longer and wider for better weight distribution and whatnot, but it's a huge car. I don't know. I haven't, you know, we'll see them when we see them, but I think this is going to be quite intimidating on the road. Um, just being so massive, and it, but it is a very lightweight car with 31 something under 3,200 pounds, I think. Um, even with the PDK, I think. I mean, I we said this at the uh kind of before the show, I'm a little bored of Porsches at this time. Um, yes, they're amazing products. Yes, they're great. They're fast, but I mean, it's 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 minor increments. It's almost like a new iPhone or a new Android device, a new Samsung phone. It's minor improvements over the last one. It's yeah. nothing that's too amazing. That's like, oh wow, that's crazy. Like the Artura, like it's a plug-in hybrid, and they made it thirty-three hundred pounds. That's yeah. pretty mind blowing. They this, really pushed in the the needle yeah. and raised the bar. Yeah, just just you know another car from Porsche. Like they have a lot of money now. They sold a lot of Cayennes, and they sold a lot of Macans. They have money to do better. I mean, they, I'm sure they put a lot of money in the R and D into the Taycan, but I don't know. I just one thing I, I would say about the GT3, this 992 is. It's a sub seven Nurburgring lap time, which is really solid, but it's worth mentioning that unlike previous GD3s, it wasn't, uh, this lap time is not faster than outgoing models, which I think, you know, that's kind of the Cayman complex. Everyone talks about the Cayman, they, they nerf it to uh, kind of make it not over, you know, cannibalize the, the 911s. Right, yeah. And, this one, to put it into perspective, the GT3 992 is going to be slower than the outgoing RS models, the GT2 and the GT3 RS. It's slower than the uh, 918 Spire, which I guess is not really a surprise. But um, yeah, it's just interesting to see that the 991 um, is is faster in the RS trims than this model because I think. In the past, the, G the 991 GT3 was quite a bit faster than uh, the other the outgoing Porsche, than the 997 GT2 yeah. Turbo S um, and the GT3. Like, it's quite quite significant. This one has not jumped that much. Yeah. yeah. 
they just they i don't think they've given up but they almost seems like they've given up they're like they they just want to make things a little bit better it's almost like intel this is <laughs> well maybe at, from a car perspective car industry perspective this is toyota this is toyota yeah. knowing they're number one they will sell regardless and we only need to do so much to get people buying and we we could literally do nothing and keep building the same car people were still buying like people are still going to keep going to the dealerships and and buying these uh it it really doesn't matter so i think yeah they haven't uh really pushed it surprise us in any way with the gt3 mm -hmm. um but with the fair. artura coming i think porsche has to step it up with the whatever the next gen's called either 993 uh generation of go Pina back Cola. to 993 name no i don't yeah <laughs> <laughs> whatever um, name they're gonna choose it has to be better it has to be well, a new chassis that's i think what we're looking for is going to be in the rs i think the rs is going to push it forward quite a bit more they don't I have think to they're not going to get there it. until the next gen they need they need some sort of hybrid hybrid technology that's like most other manufacturers are doing to have that next level of uh, performance. Yeah, it's kind of weird that they put that into the spider and then just kind of forgot about it. Like, okay, let's let's build one really special one-off car, which the spider was, and then it just not use that engineering towards uh, yeah. making their normal lineup more exciting. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of. I don't know. Just like I said, it's just kind of boring. Predictable. To me. It's boring. It yeah. is. Uh, it's Porsche at its finest. I mean, they they have such a loyal fan base. They're not. They're not looking to impress anyone. No. But who is impressing people? Chevy. Brand new Bolt, or not so much brand new. Just sort of brand new. Sort of new. Um. So the Bolt got an update, and then there's a new Bolt as well. The EUV. So instead of an SUV name, which they don't want to use because it's only front wheel drive, um, the EUV, it's a slightly taller, slightly longer, but about the same in terms of interior space version of the Bolt. Think of it yeah. as a higher riding one. It's it's six inches longer, which is not insignificant. You know, if you're gaining that in leg room, that's you're a not. lot for the second row. But yeah, it's mostly in the trunk, I guess. Nope. Um, no. Yeah, I was reading. I can't remember exactly where I was reading. It was on either Jalopnik or Motor Trend or something like that. They were saying how the interior proportions are not any bigger than the regular one. Proportions, but if your car is is X percent longer than you, keep you would the think the inside the is longer, same. but it's it's not. The, well, no, proportionally it is going to be because proportion mean one, you know, the ratio. So if you're increasing the length by 5%, then your interior proportions also, your interior dimension also increases by 5%. It's definitely a bigger cabin. There's, I think uh, it's, okay, it's three inch longer wheelbase. So you're gaining something there. Um, here's but yeah. An article from Torque News. Don't know what that's about, but the new 2022 Bolt EUV has less cargo volume than those regular Bolt with no tow rating. Yeah, so the trunk is smaller, but legroom wise, passenger volume. Okay, okay, yeah. So you yeah, get three passenger volume more is inches of legroom. So yeah, you gotta understand what proportion means. It's not right. the raw number. The raw number increase proportionally with that. Uh, you know. But always with smaller cars, you're getting more value for money in terms of volume. A Honda Fit is going to be more interior volume per pound and length, width, whatever you want to call it, than a uh, Mercedes S-Class. Doesn't mean the S-Class is not bigger, but dollar for dollar, inch for inch, the Honda Fit is a lot more space. Um, so between these two obviously a lot more conventional size with the EUV. Um, it's it's a good look. I think they've kind of brought it down to reality a bit. Uh, the interior is so much nicer, in my opinion. Um, 
but the thing everyone is kind of roasting Chevy for saying, you know, for not giving this car more range. Um, that's not really the point here. I think uh, the point is really accessibility because this EV they got to compete with the Kona Electric, which is really solid, but it's also quite small. Mm -hmm. uh, this looks physically looks bigger um, than the Kona, I think. Uh, the regular Bolt, I test drove that one. I quite liked it. It drives nice. It handles well. And their paddle regenerative braking is really good. It's super intuitive. And uh, it's a little bit better than normal kind of one one pedal driving. Is that what they call it? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, this EUV is going to be first with Super Cruise, which I think we've seen on Cadillacs before. Super Cruise with an asterisk because Super Cruise only works on certain highways. You're not going to be able to treat this as your fully autonomous vehicle quite yet. Um, but it has some of that underpinnings, you know, that we'll see a few years down the road. I think we're going to see a lot more automation uh, in terms of that. And um, yeah, this interior is just a lot more flat, not, not hard white plastic gloss white everywhere. Um, what do you think? Well, the the thing to note here is the Bolt EV is five thousand, I believe. I, I think it was five thousand dollars. Five thousand US cheaper. In yeah, Canada, then, it's six thousand dollars cheaper. Yeah, so at thirty-two thousand dollars for a Bolt EV, mm -hmm. that's not bad. That's before incentives as well. Thirty-nine I mean, before incentives, I think, is what I saw. On oh, was it? GM Canada, I was on their yeah. site and it showed me thirty-two. Oh, I think that's after incentives. That's after incentives? Oof. Yeah. That's different. Because the current one starts at 45. Mm. Yeah. This might be the US price. It is a US yeah. pricing, yeah. Yeah. Before any available state incentives. Yeah, okay. but the, the big thing is the current one is 45, the 2020 model. This one is going to be 39 before incentives. So that's, that's a significant drop. Mm -hmm. uh, and even the EUV... The new EUV is going to be cheaper than the outgoing small bolt. Yeah, the regular size one. Yeah. Yeah, which means that if you want to pick up a current generation, um, look for a hefty discount. I don't know about that. I think they've been really skimpy with their discounts on this car. Well, I mean, uh, they have to get the old ones off the lot. They have to. If the new one comes in at $5,000 cheaper, mm -hmm. they have to sell the new ones for seven thousand dollars less at least yeah it doesn't make sense right i mean it's the same battery same range as previous so it's a 65 kilowatt hour battery 259 yeah. mile range 200 horsepower and motor like it, it's the exact same as previous it's just updated looks which actually let's talk about the looks a little bit because that front end does that bug you in any way <laughs> how it has kind of two faces it it's just a little weird to me, isn't it? Because um, let's bring the picture here a little bit bigger here. The headlight, it's like the divorce headlight that we found in like Hyundai, Nissan products. I, I mean, it's its what's popular these days. Um, but what Chevy has done here is very different. The eyeliner that goes kind of from the headlight back towards the A-pillar, it just divides that like entire top like top portion of the vehicle so I've instead of a that floating fender roof, on the i3 mm, which is not yeah. the prettiest car but i like it well yeah you like weird cars i like I weird cars but like the general public is this something that's normal good looking i don't know yeah the front end is not the most uh, attractive because it just doesn't look exciting or sporty or and really electric -y. In all of their press photos none of them has the headlight on yeah i guess it must be a fog light <laughs> i don't think but i don't think that daytime running light that's up here um is bright enough as your like your main beam no. i'm thinking the headlight is still down here on the bottom uh-huh but it just it's just never on i don't know they don't have nighttime pictures of it <laughs> 
but no nope. they did this with the uh a little bit with some of their opal products they they kind of facelift mm. uh with their opal products to just make them look a little bit different from what we get over here and um I feel like I've seen this this front end a little bit, but the rear end looks pretty nice. I think it, it looks a lot more masculine, I want to say. Um, a little bit more jagged. The EUV, yeah, yeah it has a good-looking rear. I like front, the tail lights so on it. I think it's a it's pretty good-looking. It's a good shape. Yeah. yeah. It's inoffensive. It's fine. I don't think there's any problems with the way that it looks. Will it sell? Mm. Hard to say. I think so far they've been okay. They've been doing better than the Leaf with the current bolt. I think mainly because of range. It's almost double the range of a Leaf or right. whatnot. It's, it's uh, quite a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know Konas are doing well. Um, Ionics are okay. Kona is doing really well. Kona is doing uh, well, but like you said, it is quite small. But if that's small, you can just pick up the Kia Soul, which is definitely a little bit bigger. Yeah, the thing with the Bolt that kind of was the deal breaker for me is there was no lease incentive. Uh, they, they they really didn't want you to lease this car. It had a residual value, I think, after four years of about 20%. So it's a really expensive lease. Like you could lease something for probably like a, a car with a $60,000 MSRP is still going to be cheaper than this. Um, and that's the thing is Tesla's come out recently in Canada with uh, pretty decent lease rates. And I, if Chevy doesn't fix something on that uh, standpoint, I think they're going to fall behind still in Canada because people like to lease cars. I mean, I, I get it, um, you know, either as a business expense or just it's an, it's an electric car. You don't want to take that risk maybe because it's, it's, it's foreign to you. So you want to lease it and see if you like it. And then if you like it, maybe buy it out afterwards. But maybe for those four or five years, experiment, see if it's really for you. I think lease makes sense. Um, and it's good to see Tesla caught on board. Um, but Chevy, really, they're, they're kind of against leasing, I feel like. Yeah, they definitely are. Or it's just because they just have that low residual and there's nothing really that they can do about it. That's an artificially low residual, though, because, like, looking at their outgoing, the Chevy Volt, it's not bad. Like, the residual on those cars are the Volt and the Bolt. They're, they're, they're very similar-sounding names. It's very confusing. Uh, there's a four-door sedan with that's, like, a plug-in hybrid and then there's a full-on EV, but so far they they haven't been doing bad. I mean, their 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 electric cars are not bad. Overall, Chevy is not terrible resale. It's not a Chrysler, um, yeah. but you know their trucks have always been okay. And I think they their compact cars maybe not doing so well. But um, I think with the EV, they could do a little bit better. Give people a little bit incentive to lease them. Yeah. Well, I think that's really all we got to say about the Bolt here. There's not too much else. So let's move it on to Mitsubishi. <laughs> Finally, Mitsubishi. First news in probably five years. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, yeah. But Mitsubishi, as you may or may not know, is part of the Nissan Renault Alliance which means that this Mitsubishi, while it's a brand new Outlander, underneath, it's a rogue. It which is, is a not rogue. a bad thing. It's, it's not a bad thing at all, because the current rogue is absolutely beautiful. It really is. And even the outgoing rogue was pretty successful, I think. Uh, the new one is is quite promising, uh, and it's it's super practical. Look at like that. That's a lot of space uh, in in this uh, lander. That's uh, a three row SUV, I believe. Yeah. So unlike the Rogue, the Outlander is three rows. So it's going to be a little heavier than the Rogue itself. And that front end, it's um, let's call it distinctive. I I like it. We've seen this front end a little bit on recent uh, Mitsubishi products. It's I think really it, it really gives it it gives it some character. It's got that split light 
spin headlight design that you were talking about earlier that we're seeing on a lot of cars. It's got the floating roof. Um, I think in the white color with all that chrome, it's it's proper JDM styling. Like th this car <laughs> looks like looks like an import. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we'll see what the numbers say. But I I think it's it gives it some character that you don't really get with. Uh, the others on the market, you know, the the CRV is, eh, you know, it's very. Safe. Well, the CRV is older now. That's the biggest issue that it has. Yeah. Um, the Rogue is brand new, so to a lot of people, it's it's amazing. Like in my eyes, the Rogue is the the SUV to go for. But looking at the Outlander right now, I'm thinking the the exterior looks of the Outlander may be a little bit better than the Rogue. It's polarizing, but I like it. It's just more it's just more compelling to look at. The only thing I don't like about it is the front and the rear end doesn't seem like it's <laughs> they like two different the cars. Yeah. yeah. The rear it's just it is quite a bit more boring than the front. The front is super and it's quite overstyled. <laughs> the it is thing. very overstyled, but I like that. Yeah. It's very similar to like the other Mitsubishi products that we can't get here. Cause like the Delica looks very similar. Oh, yeah. It's so badass with that but front end. The the rear, the rear, it's just there's nothing there. It's quite generic. It's just two straight lines. Um yeah, the rear is is not that pretty uh i mean as far as three row crossover skill this is i would call this more of a five plus two it's not quite a you know oh, tell ride highlander pilot what have you but it's kind of a nice kind of in between when you need those seats in a pinch it's there otherwise you fold them away you don't really think about it it's still relatively practical it looks like even if those seats are folded you're still getting more room than a rav4 or a crv um Outlander's always done that, though. Even since, like, what, 06, they had a really small, crappy third row. Um, yeah. It's, which, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. Sense. It's there, is there a, as auxiliary seats, right? So, because no if you're going to set yourself apart from the competition, that is something that you can do. Yeah. Um, now, how do you like this interior? So, the interior is, is straight lifted from the Rogue. I mean, you're, there's not a huge difference. The steering wheel, I know you said you love the new Nissan steering wheel. The buttons on it, that, that's lifted exactly from the Nissan. It's the same Nissan infotainment. It's the same Nissan shifter. It's the same Nissan climate control. So, I mean, look at It's kind of the funny two, how they've, they've done the steering wheel, actually. Good thing you mentioned it. The, the Rogue has that V-Motion grill on the steering wheel. And then this one has the headlight, the chrome accents. <laughs> Yeah. on the steering wheel which i think is kind of cool it i think the interior looking at this and then i was looking at pictures of the rogue um kind of like side by side mm -hmm. i mean it's you're it's splitting a very hairs minor here. difference yeah. yeah you're splitting hairs i mean the the differences are so minimal i don't but think really that white the white pleated leather is so jdm too only japanese people could take care of those seats North Americans, we're going to destroy that with our cheeseburgers and ketchup stains. But the white interior is so nice. Uh, well, it doesn't thinking, make any sense for any family. But yeah, I was thinking just more like jeans. They'll, they'll just turn blue over time more than ketchup and burger stains. But yes, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, they look the same as what's on the Rogue, though. So that's that's also a good thing. You know, yeah, the zero gravity seats. They, it, it's like I said, it's basically the same thing. Um, the engine is the same as well. Uh, two and a half liter, four cylinder. It makes the exact same power. I believe it's 181 horsepower and 181 pound feet of torque. But because the Outlander is for three rows and it looks a little bit bigger, I'm going to assume that the Outlander is a little bit slower. It has the same CVT as well. Um, but what they do say is the Mitsubishi Outlander uses a different all-wheel drive system. I think yeah, mechanically, it has control. <laughs> yeah, but I think mechanically it's the same. It's, yeah, it's software. software differences. Yeah, because it uses the brakes to do yaw control. It's not the Evo X. Yeah, control. I really don't think Mitsubishi right now has the money 
to develop its own all wheel drive system to put in the rogue. And there's no need to really. Like, yeah. what are you doing with this this SUV that you need? With 181 kind of... horsepower, you're not drifting it. Let's <laughs> let's be so honest. Bespoke all wheel drive system. But uh, you know, it's good that you mentioned because I know you you you're considering one of these cars, uh, and I know you you think the Rogue is a really good starting point for you or kind of the next car. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it's good to mention why Mitsubishi or where Mitsubishi's position themselves in Canada. Um, the current the current Outlander it still sells. Like we were talking about, we're like, what's the appeal of this car? The Outlander and the RVR they're so dated. They've done everyone else has done two model cycles and they're still on the same one from 2012 2013. I, and I think the the RVR has been around for. Ever. 2011 i want to say um and yeah the the whole <laughs> the whole market has moved way past them but they still sell a few and you're like what in your like who in their right mind would choose this car 2010 but, oh it's only 2010 been 10 years. it's 11 it's 2011 oh, now. right <laughs> so and they've even stopped selling it in some parts of the world but <laughs> I found, I guess the key thing to mention with Mitsubishi is they got really long lease, or no, not lease, finance terms. So you're, you're building equity in a way, but they're, you're, you're getting six. <laughs> Sorry, you're building <laughs> equity on a vehicle a that Mitsubishi. is a depreciating uh, asset every yeah. single day. Okay, all right, good. Uh, what, Continue. Where, they, where people like these cars is those seven year finance terms at like 0.99% or 1.99. And they, they're still pushing that. And that's always been their thing. And the other thing is 10 year powertrain warranty on all Mitsubishis. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things, right? Um, a lot of people, when they compare vehicles, they just compare, um, well, what the price is out the door if you're paying in cash and, most people aren't buying an Outlander in cash. I mean, if you have cash for an Outlander, you have cash for much better vehicles. Yeah. Um, most people that is going to be buying this segment is looking at how can I finance this car in the cheapest way possible? And if you put an Outlander and, for example, a RAV4, a RAV4 is a few hundred dollars more a month simply because of the yeah. finance terms, the rate that it has, and just the overall product is more expensive as well. Yeah, I mean, as far as if you just look MSRP versus MSRP, it doesn't make much sense to look at an Outlander, but dollar for dollar, where you know your actual payment amount goes, that's that's where you're going to see the difference, and that's where Outlander is going to have to um, stand out above the rest. Mm -hmm. Something that. I have to note as well, the Outlander is only a few hundred dollars more than the Rogue. Right, and you're getting so those two jump seats. You're getting for... a little bit more room. In some ways, maybe better styling, um, depending on if you like the front end chrome or not. Um, but if you're looking for a Rogue, but you need a little bit more space, it may be worthwhile to go and take a look at the Outlander. Yeah, and I mean, Mitsubishi is also doing a five-year bumper-to-bumper, and I think uh, uh, you're only getting a three-year on the Rogue. So Yeah, it's a three-year warranty. Yeah, so it's not even the term of most people's lease or finance. Definitely not a finance. No. Um, so it's good to have a long warranty to cover you for those really long finance terms. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be cheap to maintain, I think. It's, it's a Nissan. It, it should be. Um, as the, long as the CVT doesn't break on this one. The Yeah, that was going to say, the only thing I'm worried about is that CVT. But the new ones, um, Nissan has said it's a lot better than the old. I mean, I mean they, are, they always say that. When are they ever going to say, oh, the new product is actually worse than the previous one? But it, it is something to worry about. I don't think it's going to be too big of a concern. Um, I think for daily driving, for people that's going to drive this thing, 150, 180 thousand kilometers um, within this lifetime, I think you're going to be okay. Um, yeah. I don't think you're going to have too many problems with it. 
I don't know if they've. They, I didn't see any mention of their plug-in hybrid. I know that was quite a popular model for a few years yeah. here in Canada. The plug-in hybrid, although really slow, was one of the first plug-in hybrid SUVs you can get. Um, and they always said it's the most popular plug-in hybrid SUV in all of. I forgot if it's like the world or Canada, but that's was mm. that was their advertising. Um, but plug-in hybrid is gone with this new model. You can only get it with that two and a half liter in line four. Uh, okay. No more V6, no more that four speed auto or whatever that they had uh, with that V6 before as well. I like it in red. Yeah, I think I think white is the color to get, but um, the red yeah. stands out. Yeah, but yeah, this or the Rogue. Which where, where are you? Where are you spending your money? Oh, that's so hard to say. Um, as I said in the Rogue review, I I would love a Rogue if it had a hybrid. I think that's the only thing that's missing. Um, if and when that comes out, and the two are just basically the same. <sighs> Looking at this front end, I really like it. I'm like, oh, I definitely want this. Then I look at the back, I'm like, oh. It's kind of boring, but I mean, if we look at the Rogue, it's not a lot better in the back end either. Because mm -hmm. let's see here, the Rogue front end looks good. I like that grill in the front, but the back, that's not necessarily it's just a stretched out kicks. <laughs> it's not necessarily better, I would say, in terms of like the overall styling. Um, I know, and style is so important. That's that's the only reason I picked the Rav Four. I don't even care about fuel economy. <laughs> I just like the look. <laughs> That's the only reason I picked the F-150. It just looked better than other 2016 trucks. So looks are important to you. Yeah, it, it's that, important you're, to me. You're, you're and you know shallow. what? I am that shallow. And you know <laughs> you know what the two best-selling cars in North America are? The F-150 and the RAV4. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, you're like, hey, you know what? Since everyone's so, buying it, it must be good. It means not only am I shallow, North America <laughs> is shallow. <laughs> <laughs> but in all honesty, the RAV4 is going to have killer resale. CRV is going to have killer resale. Rogue is going to be a little bit below that, but I think Mitsubishi is going to be even lower than that. Right. So when but it comes time knows? to selling it, like it, it definitely would be less. Who knows? Because if you're selling this five years down the road... You're buying a Nissan with no warranty versus a Mitsubishi with five years of yeah, power. Yeah, with a few years stuff. left, yeah. Yeah, so I think that that might be... And and historically speaking, cars that were twins or really closely related generally sold for around the same price, like mm -hmm. used. Um, so that's something to note as well. So I think it resale-wise, we'll see what the lease rates are. We'll see, you know... Those people in those finance departments, they know what they're doing and they kind of, their residual value does tell you some of the story uh, as far as where they predict these cars will land. I think the Rogue is definitely more conventional. The brand is more of a household name. Uh, there's more dealerships, I think, across North America for <laughs> Nissan. Uh, Mitsubishi. I think there's only like two in Vancouver for Mitsubishi. Yeah, whereas it's a, it's a smaller company. Uh, so I think that is going to hurt it uh, in terms of long-term resale and dependability but it's it's a good move for for mitsubishi i think they needed this car uh this is such a hot segment and they finally have a real competitor in this segment i think this outlander here is what's going to dig mitsubishi kind of out of that grave um it's going to be very important for them oh, it's to... not the slanted roof crossovers the x6 <laughs> yeah no, no no one cares about that I think oh. this is I think this is what's going to dig them out of the grave cuz like this is like you said this is a very important vehicle. Um like everyone's buying this type of size. The RAV4 outsells the entire Toyota range. CRV outsells the entire Honda range. It is the most popular vehicle um type and type of size. So this will get Mitsubishi out of the rut that they're currently in. And who knows, right? With this alliance that they have with, uh, with Renault as well as with um, Nissan, 
there might be something that's sportier that comes down the line. Who yeah, knows? I mean, it's it's all about money, right? At the end of the day, it has to be profitable, has to help their whole overall brand image. I think the current Mitsubishi lineup is quite depressing. The Mirage is terrible. What, the RVR is, is what else do they like have? we said, it's ten years old. They have that Eclipse, like they have, they have oh, yeah, the, right. we their Pontiac about Aztec. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's so ugly. The front end actually is decent. The front end is is actually quite dynamic looking. The overall, it's it's, a, it's an Aztec, <laughs> but not as cool as an Aztec. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Eclipse Cross since since we're since I'm on this here. Um, I drove the Eclipse Cross in 2019, I think, um, when it first came out. And I compared it to the Kona because it was uh, it's your same type of size SUV, a subcompact. Um, I, I've been a big fan of Mitsubishis. I like Mitsubishis because they're, they're great vehicles. Um, but when I got into this, the engine was super underwhelming. The... Uh, infotainment was horrible. It has been upgraded for 2022. It's now a touchscreen rather than a touchpad that it was before. Because before there was a touchpad right by the shifter and it was horrible to use. Um, that's been updated. And the looks has been updated. I think the front end looks good. It looks the same as the Outlander with that really striking X yeah, it's, it's even more aggressive because it's a little bit more pinched yeah it's, it's a very sporty looking front end but the back end is where <laughs> <laughs> so this is mitsubishi's thing eh? they just go with an over style front they've actually been doing that for a while too if you look at the mirage even the evo 10th gen i would say the front is so much more going on than the back <laughs> look at those end key wheels <laughs> it's I, so I... sad I can't even look at the Mirage. Oh, that the the Mirage is known for like I think it's the cheapest car in Canada, and it's that's the worst really car all it's known for. Canada. That three cylinder engine is so rough, um, and it's so underpowered. It's it's actually unsafe. I would say it's so <laughs> underpowered. I thought my IQ, uh, my Scion IQ, which was like ninety eight horsepower, was unsafe. That Mirage, like just it's the next level it's don't take that on the highway well it's not designed don't buy for that it. car for your kids either like <laughs> you know i know it's cheap it's tempting to you know it's only it's only 12 grand with acn and an automatic transmission but just get them something used because if they get into an accident that thing which they will because they can't get out of their own way it, it's just not safe that car um but speaking of um you know, the Outlander, that competes directly with what in the Kia lineup? Because Kia is kind of um, in line So with the them. Outlander is the only real competitor to it, I would say, is the Sorrento. Sorrento, which is quite um, a bit more expensive. It is more expensive. It's bigger, but it's the only one in that kind of rough sizing that has three rows. Cause, yeah. um, and it's bigger than a Sportage. Sportage. Yeah. Sportage, yeah. Sportage is uh is definitely quite a Sportage bit smaller. A5. Um uh the CRV, not in North America, but overseas, the CRV has an option for a third row. Um, but because in North America, the average body weight of someone in North America is higher than that of the rest of the world, they don't offer it here in North America. Yeah, and it, I mean, it wouldn't really <laughs> make much sense. It looks even, well, it's even smaller than this uh, Outlander one. So um, I've sat in it. It actually isn't too bad. Really? Yeah. When I was in Japan, I got a chance to sit into a... Well, the thing is, they they have a sliding second row. Yep. So that when, helps a lot. When you average out the room, it's not horrible. Like, I, I wasn't comfortable by any means. It's not meant to be comfortable. Yeah, no, no, no. But just for a pinch. Yeah. You, you can shove two people safely in there with seatbelts. Rather than right now, you probably just shove people in the back with those seatbelts. Yeah. At least the headrests are more conventional. And the, the Outlander's headrest, let, let's go back to the Outlander for a sec. Because the headrests on that, they've been doing this for a while too. This is not the first time Mitsubishi's kind of folded in with their headrests. It's they just, just went this... with the thinnest 
piece of it's cardboard panel looking thing. Whoa, the pictures are not working the way you should. Uh, oh. But just to put it into perspective for anyone who is uh, just listening to us on an audio only platform, uh, the Outlander's third row seat, the third row seat already looks kind of sad, but <laughs> the. How would you describe that? Like that's, it looks like an ironing board. Yeah, I was going to say it it's, a, it's half an ironing board, uh, one used on either seat. Yeah, that's and all it is. It's really unattractive, and uh, even from the outside, it looks sad. So, as a father, something that I noticed, um, the third row seat doesn't look like it has the upper anchors, which yeah. means that you probably can't actually have child seats into third row uh forward facing child seats you can probably have yeah. rear facing uh with the seat belt but i don't think there's upper anchors on the back allowing for that which means that if you were to put a forward facing seat only the middle row would work yeah so <laughs> so young children can't fit there older children won't be able to fit in there because they have legs so We'll see. We'll see how useful that. Uh, as if younger children did not have legs, but D you know, Dustin, what I mean. are you saying that people of no legs will fit in the, the third row of the Outlander? Oh, why for don't sure. you say if they don't have head as well? Because like, looks like headroom is pretty limited as well. <laughs> uh, what else about this Outlander? I think like? that's really it. There, there's nothing else that I think I have on my end here. Oh, um, <laughs> just one random side note is they debuted this Outlander on Amazon Live, which I honestly had never heard of until today. But it's basically Amazon's equivalent of like TSC, the shopping channel, or QVC in the States. So it's like where they showcase products and they just have someone talk about it. Um, and it's just on all the time, 24-7. Hmm. You can buy Amazon products, but in the press release, they're like, just to be clear, you can only buy this car in a Mitsubishi dealer. You can't buy this car on Amazon. You Wait, can't get prime shipping on it. <laughs> you can't You can't order this vehicle online and get it shipped next day? Nor can you scam us on it. <laughs> you cannot buy it, sell it, bring your 2016 Outlander, slap a return label on it, and send it back to Amazon for a full refund. No, this is only uh, available through Mitsubishi dealers. Just <laughs> wanted to make that clear. Um, yeah. It, I don't know. I think the Outlander is a little sad. Mitsubishi yeah. as a brand is a little sad. Mitsubishi but... overall is quite sad. I think I think this is uh, the first real product we're seeing in North America. Both uh, Nissan stepped it up so much that kind of Mitsubishi's catching, you know, on the tail end of that. So you mean? Yeah, we need we need the the, the new Delica. I don't think they're making the Delica still. I think the Delica's dead. I'm pretty sure the Delica's dead. There has been co oh, oh it's just me. a concept, yeah. There has been concepts, and the concepts look amazing, um, but all the Delicas are dead. Damn it! Yeah, sorry, you can't have one. <laughs> well, cool. I think that wraps everything up. Let's uh, move to the last topic here, the last video that was posted. Yeah, so every week let's try to cover some of Jimmy's content. Uh, Got some good videos this week. It was a CX-30 versus Mazda 3. Uh, I'm going to open up a browser here so things are a little bit more clean. So, yeah, um, last Monday released a new video. Oh, video, oh. Shut up, Jimmy. I don't need you to talk over myself. Oh, Pause. Mute. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, the last video was uh, Mazda CX-30 versus Mazda 3. Um, I wanted to make this video when the CX-30 initially came out because the two are very, very similar. And I get a lot of questions asking, you know, oh, which one should I get? Is the CX-30 that much bigger than the Mazda 3? 
Um, and when the turbo variant came out on both of them, I had a chance to ask Mazda to have both turbo variant at the same time so I can do a side by side. And well, this may be surprising to you, may not be, but the CX30 is slightly bigger, not by much. Um, you get maybe a little bit more headroom front and rear, and that's about it. But the biggest thing is not so much the headroom, but getting in and out of the back seat. So for those that are listening, um, you won't be able to see what I'm looking at here, but um, everyone that's on YouTube, you can see how that in the CX-30, which is on the left here, you can see my entire head. Whereas a Mazda 3, it cuts off right at my eye level, which means to get into the Mazda 3, I'm ducking to go to get in. So yes, there's lead, less headroom, but the door height itself is also lower. So if you're a little bit older, if you have kids to get in and out, the CX-30 is actually quite a bit better than the Mazda 3 just on this alone. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I, I, I found kind of strange with Mazda with this this generation. They just made it so, like the roof is sloping so aggressively now. I don't like how that resolves into the taillights. I think it makes it look a little bit hunchback. And it doesn't, I don't like the styling. I don't like the practicality aspect of it. I think the CX-30 is my personal pick. Uh, not only that, if you go back to your front, image <laughs> because we have to have front plates the cx30 looks way better with a front plate than the, than the mazda 3 does with a front plate yeah so all mazda front plates for the suvs they're mounted lower below the grill whereas their hatchbacks and sedans are mounted in the grill itself so the the placement on it is quite different um but the cx30 like i'm sure they thought of this i think it's going to be fine but that water to air intercooler, um, it's right behind that front plate for the turbo. Um, for the turbo engine, instead of just straight air to air intercooler that's used on the mm -hmm. CX-9, CX-5, as well as the Mazda 6, because the Mazda 3 and the CX-30 is a more compact package, it's a water to air intercooler. And that's right behind that plate. So I'm thinking there's reduced efficiency because of that as well. I'm sure they, you know, done some testing and I'm sure it's going to be fine, but it leads yeah. me to think if it's like really hotter climates, you're pushing the car a little bit more, would you get reduced power because of it? I think you only see heat soak at like if you're tracking or autocrossing, which on a CX-30 is not going to matter or even off-roading for that matter. Uh, but when you're off-roading, you're not getting that kind of airflow. That was one of the things on the C7 Corvette that was always an issue. And part of the C7 Corvette's track instructions is you must take off your front plate to track this car mm. uh, if you don't want it to heat, like overheat stuff. Um, but I think for a street car, it'll be perfectly fine. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. Um, fuel economy-wise, the CX-30, of course, being a little bit heavier, it's a little bit worse by like one uh, MPG. So it's not uh, a significant amount, I would say. Uh, but one thing I like about the Mazda CX-30, it's a very small detail. And I'm going to show you in this video here. Um, it's the blinker. Mm. So if you look at the light it's itself. Very sleek. Um, so... Most cars on LED, it, it's on and off. So it shines on, it shines off. It shines on, it shines off. Pretty normal. But the CX-30, it uses, um, well, a little bit of wizardry. I'm sure it's just capacitors, but it fades off. It shines bright on, but it fades off. Mm -hmm. It's a little really details. premium touch. Yeah, little things. Little things that I'm like, hey, that looks amazing. And I actually noticed that when I was actually locking the car. I was like, huh. That fades off. That's weird. And I look, you know, I checked all around. It's every single light. It's cool. Yeah, no, I think the CX-30, in my eyes, it's a better looking car. And it's a more practical car. So I don't really see much of a reason for the uh, Mazda 3 to exist. But, you know, people still buy it. Um, yeah. Well, driving the two back to back, I mean, the Mazda 3 drove better. Um, it was definitely harder to accelerate or sorry it accelerated better like it was it pushed me back in the seat harder 
Um, just because yes. the final drive ratio, there is a difference there. And of course, the weight. But the CX-30 is no slouch. And I think that's the best part about it. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at historically, the Mazda 3's competitor was kind of that Golf. It's a little bit upscale compared to your Civic or Corolla. Um, but the Golf is getting phased out in Canada. Even though it's one of the most popular cars in Europe, it's it's not going to be in North America anymore. We're only going to be getting the GTI and the Golf R. Mm-hmm. So that kind of tells you where Volkswagen stands with this compact hatchback variant is the Tiguan is definitely going to stay because that's pretty good sales volume leader. Mm-hmm. But uh, the CX-30, I think, is is kind of the, the value buy and it's uh, where the market is shifting. And I don't see any problem with that. I know a lot of car enthusiasts are really against that. Like, oh, everyone's getting crossover these days, blah, 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 SUVs. <laughs> and it's like, what are you doing with your hatchback that you you, you need that extra... 0.3 G's in the in the G circle, uh, you know, or extra 0.2 seconds off your zero to sixty, right? Um, when I drag race kids on the highway, I mean, I, I need my car to be just that 0.2 seconds faster. And a CX30 <laughs> will destroy a BRZ in a straight line, anyway. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Like, you what know. do you have against my background right now? <laughs> You're you're absolutely right. The CX are, I mean, there's there's plenty of torque. There's 320 pound feet of torque. It's it's great vehicle. Um, the only thing that some people are complaining about is the transmission. It's a six speed um, Mazda in house automatic. I know you're not a big fan of it. I personally don't mind it. It has a pretty good and flat torque curve where you're able to accelerate and even a higher gear at a lower RPM with basically no problems. Yeah, well, the turbo for sure. Yeah. It's got lots of torque on demand. I, uh, I think it was like a 2,000 RPM. Starting at 2,000, you get 320 pound-feet or less than that, actually. Is the ground clearance actually any better on the CX-30? It is. Eight inches of ground clearance compared to 5.5 on the Mazda 3. That's significant because... You know, not that you're going to off-road, but ground clearance is nice to have. Like, even, like, some parking lots, like, uh, what's that, Champlain Heights? Like, there's some pretty steep, uh, like, the ramp. Know, the ramps exit and yeah. just your parking blocks and stuff. You know, I know a lot of people, like, <laughs> or you just, you just can't judge that distance sometimes because of where you're sitting in the car. And if you want to drive over a parking block uh, a little bit, you're okay on a CX-30, whereas you're going to do a bit of damage on a, a Mazda yeah. 3. And uh, the, I think it's nice to have. Yeah, the Mazda 3 in the U.S., the turbo models, you actually get a little bit of um, a front splitter or, like, a front air dam, mm-hmm. uh, which of course, reduces that front ground clearance a little bit more. Even so more, there, yeah. there is going to be a little bit of damage on those curbs if you're not careful. Yeah. Um, but the Mazda 3 comes with a 360 camera. So, you know, you can enable that and you can mitigate that issue. In the oh, U.S., yeah. the CX-30... actively doing it. <laughs> yeah. In the U.S., the CX-30 also has a 360 camera. But in Canada, we don't get it because we can park here. I don't know. I guess. And also, <laughs> I guess it doesn't have any real competitors that have it or any real uh, competitors to begin with. You mean the Mercedes GLA, the Which BMW is 20 grand X2, more. <laughs> um, the Volvo XC40? Those or are the, the uh, true Infinity GLA. Oh, the, the QX30? That's yeah, not that even thing. around anymore. Is it gone already? I'm pretty <laughs> it sure it's gone. gone already um but yeah no i think the ground clearance maybe it's a vancouver thing but there's just so much road work and construction and potholes it's just like i like having that extra ground clearance um even though it's not a lot like you know it's not it's not meant for off-roading but just in your day-to-day if there's a pothole manhole cover sticking out you don't have to worry about it quite as much when you have that extra three inches of ground clearance it's it's literally the difference between busting your oil pan and just you know, driving along like nothing yeah. happened. Well, for those who aren't mall crawling, um, like Justin here is in his RAV4, the Mazda 3 will be fine. But for those who, who want to, you know, stomp some curbs, if you may, 
the CX30, it's a good alternative. Um, I, the styling of it sometimes, the I don't like the fender flares. The there. the They're flares a are a little side. much. Um, They're a little much for such a low car. That's yeah. The thing. <laughs> Because like if we look at the the three, I mean the three is so fluid on a side. It it looks really nice there, um, and the the CX30 with those body with the body cladding, it just it, it does ruin the lines a little bit. What's the price difference between these two again? Oh, that's the best part. Um, in Canada, the price difference between the two is minimal. Let me see here. It is. It's six hundred and fifty dollars um, price difference in Canada, and hundred and fifty dollars in the U.S. So it's nothing, yeah. So get a CX thirty is my my advice. <laughs> and yeah, and it, uh, if you're talking to me, I will say you get the uh, Mazda three unless you have kids. Uh, then get a CX five. Oh. <laughs> the the CX thirty. It can fit kids, but no, it's not designed to fit kids. It's it's got a more usable back seat. It's got a more usable trunk. It's got a little bit more ground clearance for me. Yeah, that's that's why I pick it. But I I get some people still want that sporty compact car, but I'm over it. Yeah, if well, I want a sports car, I get a sports car. That's kind of always been yeah. kind of where you stand on that. Yeah. Yeah. For those who can't afford an actual sports car. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that really wraps up today's call. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to kind of go over? I don't believe so. Perfect. Well, in that case, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, tuning in, watching on YouTube or listening in to whatever podcast app that you're on. Um, we'll be back next week. And we'll talk some more news and whatever other car topics that we may have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.